A questo punto inizia la trasmissione. Tutti i partecipanti sono in grado solo di ascoltare. A very uh, good morning and welcome to the ladies and gentlemen who are attending our um, fourth uh, uh, webinar on digital transformation in Africa, particularly in the sector of energy. Um, I just will give you a, a few slides of welcoming and introduction. I am Roberto Bigotti, Secretary General of the Foundation, and uh, I represent here, next slide, um, the variety of the uh, company who are now uh, associated. You see a vast um, range of European uh, uh, leaders uh, engaged in Africa. All of them have a stake in Africa. 
in dialogue with the local regional partners next slide so you the um, logos of those uh, uh, institution utility agency with which we have a strong uh, connection uh, working connection in both side of the um, continent in Mediterranean and uh, Sub-Saharan Africa and next slide shows also a wider uh, network of international partner all of them we are engaged either in projects either in uh, um, training either in uh, additional um, outreach so we think we are now uh, fully embedded in the um, uh, dialogue europe africa for um, the so-called just energy transition next slide shows to you just the um, title of the uh, more important uh, uh, sectors where we work, in addition to the regional one, of course, uh, from the missing link uh, with UNECA to investigate policy and regulatory framework of the, of the African country, to Union Africa, a new EU-led EU program for guaranteeing investment at scale, Grids for Africa, which will be launched the 15th of July, by the way, in a very large uh, audience, uh, Please be sure to be there. Uh, 15 of July, we have this launch of the cluster of activities to grids. Today, we are, of course, the innovation and digitalization, which is a cross cutting issue, but which we think is so important and linked to many of our uh, dimensions of working there. And of course, uh, uh, the ultimate goal for the transition is the job and socioeconomic impact of uh, clean energy. Our next flagship, which will be released in September, in fact, uh, will deal with the jobs uh, and the socioeconomic impact growth for the just energy transition. And of course, uh, the final, but not least, uh, the access to energy program. Next slide shows the motivation, is a broad slide for uh, the energy sector in Africa. Uh, uh, what I want like to underline today is the demographic uh, uh, growth, and then uh, the number two slide, uh, number two camp caption, uh, more than 50% of the population in Africa will be living in a big city uh, 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 in the near future. So uh, what will happen? Well, you see, uh, next slide, just to give you an idea of our problem, not only when we talk about access to energy, and next slide shows the um, impact, we don't talk only about uh, um, rural electrification or large scale. You see here, this is Johannesburg. You see on the left, uh, um, the modern city, a uh, California style city. On the right, uh, just uh, separated by a freeway, you see the peri-urban areas uh, where it's very difficult indeed to provide electricity and to include uh, digitalization there. Next slide shows a very similar one situation in um, another big city in Nairobi and you see here again on the top part of the picture you see uh, again the modern side the modern uh, look of uh, African city which we all want to be there just below the wall you see the slums of this thing so we, the, this is in my opinion one of the biggest and not so much spoken issue of um, uh, access to energy where we also find difficulty to in, include digitalization Finally, the third photo shows a even more dramatic. Next slide shows even more dramatic is Lagos. When there's a flood there, you can imagine how difficult it is to provide electricity and how difficult to do operation and maintenance in this situation in, this, in another huge megalopolis of Lagos in Nigeria. So overall, next slide, we think that uh, uh, digitalization in Africa will transform, is transforming already people's lives. Uh, in the sense that uh, the uh, diffusion speed and reach, in some cases like uh, telecommunication, uh, on telebanking is going very fast. Unfortunately, not so much also in energy. Uh, it is also uh, the, the digitalization, a people-centric uh, uh, approach because it will impact uh, the life and uh, personal life, but also business life and family life. And of course, will uh, in, include the new business model I do understand that unless you have resolved also the issue of distribution there, and it is a thing that Schneider Electric always reminds me, how can we go there to do new business model if we don't get access to the distribution? Uh, so you see on, on, the, on the bottom some uh, solutions which are taking place everywhere and more and more in Africa. 
Next slide also shows you the um, what we, we have in our mind. We think that uh, digitalization in energy will be able to break down boundaries between the sectors, will facilitate the rest integration, of course, which is also a key um, issue. The more renewable are in, 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 in uh, there, the more they have to be integrated in uh, large scale and mini grids and system. Connectivity also, with the digitalization will have the potential to have a higher the, the connected system uh, and the transformation of the supply. I will show you just a few examples. And finally, new digital tools. I think we have to introduce uh, not expensive, but uh, efficient digital tools uh, in, in the short term. Next slide again shows you uh, just uh, the energy sector why we think the transformation of the renewable energy sector can be taken advantage from uh, digitalization. And I just list there, I am sure that my colleagues, uh, which will speak later, will uh, highlight uh, this very clearly. Next slide again shows you a sequence of uh, five slides. The first one is, is the situation in the past, but sometimes this is still a situation in many, many utility, which is a centralized, uh, of course, a unidirectional flow a distinct roles of the several sector, while next slides, of course, shows the different, different views that we have, that the digitalization will um, uh, change the behavior, the flow of energy, and will include, uh, as you see, different uh, um, a, a sector of the energy system on both sides, generation and end use. And I give you just a quick snapshot of three examples, again from the IEA, which I worked with. The next slide shows you how uh, this can be done on uh, demand response. The residential sector can be one of the most important uh, end use, particularly in flexibility. Uh, where you can match uh, demand response uh, and it can also uh, help a lot to the integration of renewable in the grid. Next slide shows also the um, another sector, which is uh, the smart charging. We do believe, and then even nowadays, uh, the IEA and others in, uh, claim that uh, from 2030, at least in Europe, there will be no more combustion cars, but only electrical cars. And we do think that uh, the a smart charging of, of, of um, a vehicle will be an essential part uh, two ways because in one way you provide your car to the system they can charge you but they also can use you as one of the millions and millions of batteries scattered around the system to uh, compensate and, and uh, flexibility so this is a concept that we already envisage in europe and i'm sure also in africa will happen but smart charging for vehicles especially fast charging will be uh, the issue and the last example of course for this one uh, is uh, the idea yeah, there now let's go on on the next one next one is uh, the um, integration renewable you see uh, having a, um, a much more interconnected and digitalized system will strongly reduce the curtailment in this case of solar power and wind which is uh, sometimes claimed as a, a defect of the renewable. Uh, if the system is interconnected, if the system is digitalized from forecasting to uh, real-time use, it will be uh, very easy to reduce the curtailment. By the way, some of the curtailment is also reduced because of smart charging and so on. So to conclude my final slides, the next slide, uh, it is our program after this uh, webinar. We think we have to boost the adoption of innovative low-cost digital solution to accelerate the transformation of the system, to enhance the knowledge and human capacity. We are doing this in this seminar, but at the end of the seminar, the webinar, we make a robust program of training capacity building, including our ongoing training. We want to support the African country in scoping and selecting uh, the solution. We want to demonstrate uh, you know, evidence-based the benefit of innovative solution and also for the broad public and finally showcase the potential renewable to foster this one then uh, uh, just a quick snapshot of the four next slide uh, we are almost done with the, the you see we have uh, planned five uh, webinar today we are number four the next one in september will be the last one how to improve the flexibility of the grid using storage all them are available on our website and carlo who is the coordinator can tell you how you can download the presentation so at the end we will make a summary of what we have shared and also your reaction
to what what are the priority to that. Uh, next slide shows also uh, just an image of how we man imagine the future for the city with all those uh, components. And I think Africa should be um, helped to speed up the adoption of this image. And uh, finally, the, really the last one is a collection of a title of a paper. If you're not familiar with the topic, you can go on the website and find all these are free of charge. You can download them uh, and make a, a first assessment of the digitalization in case Carl will be more than glad to provide you the link. But those are some of the most uh, basic uh, um, publication to start with. With this, I uh, thank you very much for attending. I give the floor to Carlo Cecchetti, who is the coordinator and looking forward for the in very exciting uh, presentation made by NL uh, Efri, NL Green uh, Energy, May Technimon, Siemens Gamesa, Schneider. I thank you so much. Carlo, the floor is yours and thank you for your effort. Thank you, Robert. Thank you, Roberto. Good morning to everyone. First of all, uh, let me answer to your question, Roberto, about where to take all the materials and where to uh, subscribe for the coming, for the next webinars and to download the previous documentation. You just have to go to our website, www.resforafrica.org. Then in the section uh, strategic webinars, you find the innovation and digitalization one and then you have the list of the previous webinars with the uh, documentation with the powerpoint presented and also uh, in, uh, in the coming september you will see the link to subscribe for the next uh, webinar uh, thank, thank you once again roberto for uh, your introduction now it's time uh, to involve uh, our uh, uh, speaker, our partners in uh, this very interesting discussion about innovation and digitalization. The, the first uh, speech will be about the role of uh, ESG topics, uh, we mean the environmental, social and governance topics in the development of the infrastructure in Africa. Uh, we have the pleasure uh, to have with us uh, Mr. Riccardo Traverso, Senior Prin Principal of AFRI, who will uh, speak uh, about this very, very interesting issue. Uh, Ricardo, uh, good morning, welcome, the floor is yours. Thank you, thank you, Carlo. Can you, I hope that you can uh, hear me well. And uh, thank you to, uh, to everybody. Uh, I would like to, to make this uh, intervention on the, on the role of the environmental, social, and governance topics uh, in the development uh, of uh, great projects, uh, infrastructure projects uh, in Africa. Uh, please go on with the slides uh, so I can introduce the agenda. I structured the the, the speech on uh, three on three sections. Uh, I would like to make a short introduction on. Uh, uh, on A3. Okay, please go ahead. Next uh, slide. And uh, uh, by introducing A3 and uh, the A3 group uh, within a couple of minutes uh, in order to present, uh, please go, go ahead. And, uh, and then introduce the sustainability context uh, where we are uh, moving today. And then uh, uh, going to deep in the uh, environmental, social, and governance topics that can influence uh, uh, that today are really strategic in the development of uh, uh, great infrastructure projects in Africa. Okay, uh, AFRI is a, a leading engineering uh, and advisory company uh, coming from the merger of uh, two important players, uh, OF Consult and Coyote Energy Management. Uh, based in the Nordics. Uh, uh, the company has uh, more than uh, 17,000 uh, employees uh, around the world, mainly based in uh, Sweden and Finland, but uh, help them uh, around, uh, around Europe and US. Uh, we, we are locally in, in, present in more than 50 countries and uh, we operate in more than 100 countries by developing projects uh, on, the, on the following uh, projects that uh, I will describe to you. In the next slide, uh, a brief introduction on the structure of the company. 
we are uh, structured in five divisions. Uh, the divisions are uh, uh, separate uh, in infrastructure division, where we operate as engineering company on great uh, projects, uh, infrastructure projects like uh, on transportation buildings uh, and uh, 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 water plants, etc. And uh, uh, the, the second division is process, uh, mainly on process industries, when we advise companies on bio industry processes and chemicals, metal and mining. And uh, the third is industrial and digital solution. We uh, we are supporting company in, in the digital transformation path and uh, roadmaps. Uh, the fourth pillar is the fourth division is the energy division when we uh, advise companies on the project and designing the and project management and designing project management on great thermal and renewable hydro uh, uh, plants. And the fifth uh, division is the, the one that uh, I'm operating in personally is the management consulting and uh, please go, go ahead in the next slide where I finish the presentation on uh, of AFRI uh, by introducing the activities that uh, are uh, carried on by by uh, the management consulting division we are focused on uh, uh, strategic advice uh, and the on the operational excellence operating as an um, uh, expert on market analysis uh, on the energy commodities uh, uh, markets uh, and then on the transaction services. And uh, on the transaction services, I, I, I start the connection with the, the, with the, the things that I would like to, to, to discuss today. Please, please go ahead because uh, uh, where we are today, it, it's important to make this uh, first uh, introduction on the sustainability context. Uh, go ahead a couple of slides in order to introduce the sustainability context. Uh, actually, uh, starting from a high level, uh, we have uh, several mega trends that are going on today. Uh, in particular, uh, you will uh, you will see how I just uh, sum up in this in this uh, very high level uh, slide. I will just stress the importance of some mega trends that you can recognize as climate change and uh, also the the complex supply chain that uh, today implies for companies uh, a growing attention or what happens outside their perimeters and their borders no the climate change as previously uh, cited by by mr bigotti uh, has impacts uh, uh, now that we can see uh, almost everywhere i will enter into detail after the millennials' growth is important since the expectation of millennials are changing, also in terms of expectation of the attention to the environment by the operators and by companies. And uh, I would uh, enter into details uh, afterwards of the ESG risks uh, uh, that uh, I inserted in these mega trends because actually the importance on, of the environmental, social and governance aspects in, is growing within uh, companies and investors that are requesting the specific respect of uh, standards uh, on companies operating their, uh, their activities. Uh, in, in the next slide, uh, I, would, I, I just intended to stress the importance that actually uh, we have on the environment by citing the uh, World Economic Forum uh, uh, Global Risk Report. Uh, well, you can see easily that uh, the environmental and climate change risks are uh, uh, mapped as the most impactful and probable within uh, within uh, within next years. You can see the extreme weather climate uh, climate uh, action failure. So the failure of the climate mitigation measures that uh, we are uh, put in place, the risk is that they are not enough is high, and uh, biodiversity loss. These these are environmental risks that are considered, as you can see from the 20, 2020 global risk report for World Economic Forum. Uh, we can we can go ahead in order to enter much more in detail on the importance of the ESG. Of the uh, of the sustainability of the sustainability topics, just uh, a, a quick overview of the benefit of a sustainable approach within company operations. Mm, it, 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 you can see it, it is a dense it is a dense slide with a lot of information. I will just, just I will just stress uh, 
I would just stress the importance uh, of, uh, uh, you can see here listed, uh, represented the benefits for the company, for the society in approaching, in embedding a sustainable approach within company strategy. Um, within company strategy. So uh, it, it is important now to stress I would just just a couple of of of, of, the, of the, um, characteristics here the well, the improve Of, of the, the relationship between the organization and the stakeholder because the stakeholder involvement in a, in context like Africa uh, requires a commitment by the company in terms of iterating the uh, sustainability activities within their operation. So the stakeholder engagement uh, is one of the, the of, of, of the effects of, of a real sustainable strategy adopted by the company and the other that i would stress in this slide without spending too much time on this is the uh, supply chain currency because as i said before the supply chain approach the supply chain um, analysis so what happens outside perimeter uh, is actually one of the areas in your and the of the company that means uh, uh, European companies, uh, international companies that operating uh, need to uh, assess clearly, uh, what happens on the switch. Uh, I will go uh, another call of the head because I would like to uh, emphasize and detail on that uh, how, in, uh, how, which, sorry, which are main uh, risks and uh, that I find in, in products in Africa. I would stress the, the impact of climate change, the need to need the home. Of uh, uh, making an of scenarios in uh, in Africa, uh, the, the inside the Lagos in Nigeria, you know, the risk of the rising of sea levels, as you can see, if the, the we can uh, the next uh, the two, two, the, two uh, the, the the present extractive industries uh, that are present on Africa sorry, and the for companies operating there uh, in the beginning of the EA analysis and the impact that the company's activities uh, are affecting uh, on those territories. And uh, so, probably we can go on with the next slide. Okay, so this is it. So you can see the impact of climate change. So the, the risks of floods and roads are uh, obviously impact on the economic, uh, on the agriculture dependent economies, economies of the of the territory, and also the extractive industry presence is strongly affected by the need of evaluation of ESG risks. Uh, of ESG risks. Uh, just the final slide on the sustainability context, please uh, please go, go ahead, uh, because uh, I would like to stress there's uh, these specific aspects of uh, the integration of sustainability within within uh, company operations, because this is an epochal an epochal transformation and approach. Uh, I would not stress too much on the technicality of the approach of sustainability, but uh, uh, you know that CSR, the corporate social responsibility, as in the last 20, 30 years, a light motive, or more in the last years, a light motive for companies to approach sustainability. So from a company, driven approach on the on the perimeter now the the the, the aim into is to uh, moving on a create creation of shared value on the territory this is a very epochal change because it means that sust the, the sustainability must embed the company activities at all levels so it is not just make operations in a better way but it just make sustainable operations that operations that are sustainable so the sustainability in the 
in the evolution from the CSR to CS to creation of the shared value approach is really is really um, moving towards a, a, a change of paradigm no, on this. So uh, from uh, uh, an approach of creation of value to an approach of creation of value on the territory. So this is very important to uh, have this in mind in order to uh, better understand how improve and how integrate the ESG attention on the on the company activities. So we can move on the on the on the third part of the presentation because. I would like to stress and to enter into detail what uh, on what we mean by uh, please go ahead by integrated the, the environmental, social, and governance. What does it mean? Well, this is the main uh, this is the main picture, and this is not exhaustive because when we talk about environmental, social, and governance, we talk we don't we talk we don't talk only about the E of environmental. So the sustainability is not just environmental. Under environmental, we talk about climate change, biodiversity, pollution, water use, energy, and uh, uh, there is a precise list of uh, topics. No, but we talk about also labor standards, customer responsibility, the health and safety of workers, the health and safety of co cooperators, of uh, of uh, suppliers, and the, of human rights. And we talk about governance. Governance, we mean that we talk about uh, processes and how how companies are managing processes which requires competence and skill at all levels. So when we talk about anti-corruption and uh, we talk about the risk management and uh, in uh, you know that in some countries, uh, the risk of anti-corruption, the risk of uh, tax transparency is very high. So we need to, we need to set uh, procedures and, uh, pr uh, and uh, procedures and policies within the company that can help in a better approach these these uh, these topics in the development of great projects in, in, and infrastructures. So we can we can move on the, on the next slide because we we'll, uh, I, I would just stress a couple of examples. You no, know, when we talk about environmental, social, and governance. And uh, I highlight the, the, the ones that uh, in the development of great uh, infrastructure projects uh, we can we can find. So under the environmental project, the, 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 the change in regulation on environmental performance, the, the use of scarce resources, uh, the water, and also the, 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 the sourcing practices as, as uh, responsible source materials. When we talk about materials and the supply chain under, for example, uh, the, the 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 supply of uh, battery we talk about some uh, uh, minerals eh? and uh, also the recent conflict minerals regulation uh, approved by the uh, uh, EU is one uh, is just an example so of how to handle uh, the supply chain of uh, uh, these kind of materials so it is uh, it is important to put in place procedures and and uh, policies on this within the company under the social under the social pillar we talk about the human rights and uh, the, uh, the the human rights and the evidence of treating uh, treating properly uh, local uh, local uh, human workers uh, and uh, and also child labor and mother slavery these are very very important topics to to manage in the development of such projects in in, in these areas um, and then on the governance the governance you can see the bribery corruption and responsible tax uh, uh, record obviously these are these are topics that are central and the risks for these are very very high in uh, in the development of these uh, of, of, of projects so the setting of code of compliance and uh, um, internal uh, standards uh, and uh, I, I will show after the final slide the, 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 uh, what could be uh, the, the, the answer no, to, the, the, to this kind of risks. Uh, uh, please move on in, in, in the next slide. And uh, I will, uh, in the next slide, I would just uh, stress uh, uh, the, 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 the main risks that we can uh, 
that we can find uh, in the development uh, of such projects in such uh, complex uh, territory. You know? On the ecological uh, point of view, and then uh, uh, on the bribery and anti-corruption. So how the company is prepared to manage such risks in developing in such countries and uh, how to reduce investors' risk because investors are requesting to uh, make evidence of the, pre of the policies and procedures that the company has put in place uh, uh, to manage and to uh, reduce this kind of risk. And, um, and so these uh, these are the these are the main risks. What, what could be the answer? What could be the best practice to answer to this? Um, in the final slide, the final slide. This is just uh, some tips for discussion because there are several uh, means and tools uh, on the market uh, for companies that uh, are. Uh, sometimes usually adopted by companies uh, and sometimes not uh, based on my, my experience so uh, the, it is important to stress uh, the convenience to adopt uh, for example uh, methodologies as a social impact assessment in order to for great projects infrastructure to adopt uh, some tools that some uh, uh, like social uh, like the calculation of the social return on investment for example or adopting impact investing methodologies that are uh, central uh, for for some uh, for some projects uh, in, in africa in in, in uh, specific areas also the stakeholder engagement is a very very important uh, uh, activities which is uh, uh, central in the development of, of, of a sustainability strategy so the involvement of local, of local communities of local uh, um, operators you know before before uh, starting the project so in the, in the starting phase of the project it is important to evaluate this aspect uh, besides that go oh, oh okay that go that goes further the pure legislation the, the, the pure compliance that is the, the that is the, the the important and the final the final pillar is the tools that uh, it's not exhaustive as i've mentioned because there are there are a lot there are a lot of uh, of conventions and uh, references to look at uh, on the environment social and governance uh, sometimes at the same time there is the need of uh, um of optimizing which would be the best the best so uh, uh, so so for example the the, the international standards uh, the, the international standard and uh, and so this is this is the picture that i wanted to to share with you today obviously this is a very wide uh, this is a very wide topic uh, because uh, it implies uh, the involvement of several functions within the company and uh, so, but I hope that this could be a, a good point for discussion uh, in, in, other, in other context. And sorry for and probably a couple of minutes. Th thank you very much, Ricardo. Very interesting, and uh, I think it's uh, really a very good uh, food for thoughts for our uh, for our listener to this webinar. Thank you very much once again to Olaf for their contribution. Now uh, it's time uh, to, to, um, to go for another very central topic uh, of this webinar uh, regarding the future of grids in Africa. And uh, here we have with us uh, uh, Mr. Marcelo Castillo Agurto, who is the head of business development of Enel Global Infrastructure and Network. Uh, welcome, uh, Marcelo. The floor is yours. We don't hear you, Marcelo. Thank you very much, and thank you for all the people. That... And now you are hearing me? Yes, very well. Okay, thank you very much to everybody, and excuse me for the microphone aspects, and uh, please, uh, Try, I will be and try to will be very, very fast on this presentation. It's important to me that we are now giving to you, to all our participants, our colleagues, our vision from the, uh, let me say, company point of view. Huh? As you know, we operate in a lot of countries. 
including Brazil, Colombia, Chile, Peru, Argentina, or the half of Spain, all Italy, and also Romania, then we have a lot of experience in managing uh, not only the networks, also the, the improvement on the technology, and also the areas that are com conflicted areas, like favelas in Rio de Janeiro. No? Then, if we have a lot of uh, experience, then that gives to us a lot of uh, conclusion on how to do it better. Huh? We are not experts, we are only have more and more uh, situations that give us more, uh, let me say, resilience due to the different issues that are always trying to uh, get in us more harder than what we do. And that's the reason that we are going to show to you today our, our human and humble experience. Thank you very much. This is Africa. We have this uh, tuk tuk from the India with the photovoltaic. We want to put that bit in India in the next let me say 10 years to introduce in or maybe in Delhi or in Mumbai, and that is a good issue. How they, the points that we are going to touch today are for one, how can we increase the energy access? We have a lot of city that was shown by Roberto Bigotti, cities between, beside, very, very uh, close to the favelas, to the uh, slums. And on the other side, the point two is how can private can make sustainable this? Um, because sustainable means a lot of things. We're going to show an example of how we construct some uh, substations in Colombia, in, uh, in areas involving all the people, how we prepare the people to work in our barretos in Peru, how we convert the energy from the trash to energy garbage to energy in, in Brazil. Then there are a lot of private sustainable actions you need to involve the people to be part of your project. If not, you're not going to succeed on this. Huh? The third is how you can increase the performance, the grid, the quality, the acceleration, the metering, the, uh, the, the domotic issue, the, the electric car, the trans energy transformation without increasing the tariff. This is point oh, not only in Africa, it's also in Europe, also in the USA. We're studying a lot of very developed countries like Australia, etc. But it's a, it's a matter in all the, the brains and in all the stakeholders how we can do it better with less price, with the efficient price. And the fourth, how we can do increment on the grid performance without uh, only the investment issue. Maybe you can do better without investment. Hmm? Okay, next. The first okay. introduction, the DSO, collaboration, and that's it. How we can, as a network, be part of this energy transformation? Uh, I need to, to make a very important point here for all of you, please, is the transformation and the energy transition that we are suffering today for, for a good for a good reason is because everything is going to change. <clears throat> we're talking about the electric sector for sure. It's a matter that is here and we cannot avoid it. All the networks in Africa, all the networks in Europe, all the networks in Brazil, all the networks in USA are going to be reinforced because it's coming a total disrupting transformation. More renewables, more domotic, more consumers that are intelligent, a lot of electric cuts introducing the energy in the network, a lot of systems interacting between the wholesale market and the, the, let me say, the low voltage market, and we cannot avoid that. We cannot avoid that the, you need to move the demand, you need to be flexible, like a battery in a network, like a hydraulic plant. You need to integrate all the, what is happening in the rest, let me say, green energy, and finally, you need to be reliable. Huh? Reliable in a world that is changing. I like a lot the slide that was mentioned by, by our friends from AIRI, that they mentioned about the, all the risks in the world. There's a lot of risks in the world. For example, in California, you have a lot of fires that without a very good technology approach in the network, you cannot solve the issue of the blackout. That is reality. Burn. Fire reliability, you need to be ready for that, all for the wind, all for the storm, all for the water, all for the earthquake, also with the high temperatures. It's, it's a matter of every year we suffer in our networks, all with extreme cases. Not this is a particular extreme cases. Always you are suffering the news on the extreme condition and you need to be prepared. Next. Thank you. Okay. Sustainability, digitalization, and pillars for DSO. Let's go ahead. Next. Next. Okay. This is how we see the energy in ENA huh? and the network in energy. The pillars for our distribution service and, and how we do it in the world, 
you have six components very very strong uh, let me say develop in in our in our experience huh? the first is the sustainability and sustainability is means that the people do not like today the co2 huh? the people do not like today the aggressive construction of the lines the people do not like the uh, technologies that are not friendly with the need of the people huh? they want sustainability vision then we need to allow and we need to align on that with the government's agenda with the regulatory tariff publication and also with the stakeholders that are making a lot of investment in and as you maybe saw in the news we put some uh, sustainable bonds in the last week for three billion euros in the market and more than uh, 10 times the offer of the demand of this bono there are a lot of investors that wants from the utility like us to have a very clear plan to reach the sustainable goals then it's not a matter of marketing also the financial markets are putting money with a vantageous rate of return to us when we make sustainable targets less co2 more flexibility more digitalization more smart grid more smart meter etc the second is the energy assets you cannot do whatever do you want when you have these slums covering sao paulo we have today sao paulo 20 million people for example and we have the slums there and we have in rio de janeiro the same in copacabana we have the street and then we have the slums then you cannot avoid the energy access to all your concession it's not a matter i want to sell any all for the rich people or for the industrial people you need to attend everybody the government and also the people who are missing who have, don't have the access we have also in lima and we need to work a lot on that proposal a smart a subsidies a smart a technical low cost a smart a tariff subsidy etc the third is the innovation we're going to talk about of that and after that innovation for example we are today digitalizing all the networks we are making a digital twin from the physical network to a digital network so we are simulating we have our lines in a simulation inside the computers then to making the analysis of the failures and the maintenance uh, scheduling it's like a body if it's like you make a digitalization of your body you have a running system that simulates your body and your disease and your prevention prevention disease it's very important innovation using the technology the second is the regulation you need to be always proactive proactive with the government a concession of energy distribution is always a concession that the first responsible is the government we are not a private private we are delegated from the government to make a public service a concession to do it very well then the dialogue with the government continuous dialogue is very fundamental and we're going to show to show to you how we do in the investment also into the tariff reductions the third is the technology technology is also smart meeting we who today we have 50 million smart meetings in the world and technologies to do more quality and less cost uh, is not to do more cost and less quality technology is to be better to become better it's not also to need to implement the that is to become better hmm? and finally there is resilience resilience snow storm wind fires and also the tournaments and storm and maybe some at top of we talk about one time about the uh, the fires in california okay yeah. next let's go more fast now excuse me for the introduction uh again and then we're going to be we need to negotiate very well the tariff we we people ask government we need to dialogue with everybody stakeholders everybody wants to be better at the less cost and finally proposing innovation is a solution is the only way to make the energy access to everybody also in, in africa and in india and also as we see in all latin america where we operate now, okay this is a very clear picture that we can put in the next meeting. Uh, Roberto, we, we can put Africa, you agree here, no? Uh, here's America, 1 billion people, Europe, 1 billion, 0.7, and Asia, India, 1.4 billion. In all these countries and regions that we know very well, there are long-term concessions from 30 years to a, a perpetual concession. Then the government give to us 30 years to concession every four or five years they recalculate the tariff they adjust the reality all the investment are more or less the, the regulatory asset multiplied by a regulatory rate then if we have an investment they give you to you a payment and only payment to pay all the capex but this is more important is number three 
in all these developing countries in Europe, we have more incentive in the regulated rate to do the investment. Okay, then if we in Europe we have five, in India we have ten. Why? In all America the same, huh? Latin America completely. Why they give the double? Because they need to attract investment to these countries, okay, to make the growth the, to be reality. And you mentioned maybe, but this that double is so strange. No, because when you do that, a lot of growth, when the when you grow the, the consumption, the economic of a scale of the network allows less tariff. Then you need to incentive to put more investment to make the growth of the map. Then the question in a monopoly uh, economic scale, the tariff will be reduced. This is very important to explain to our stakeholders in the we do a profit sharing. Number five is the final point to do in this slide. The profit sharing in all the markets, if we reduce one dollar in efficiencies, half need to be for the tariff, less tariff, and half to the investors. Then if you have profit sharing incentives, also in UK, also in USA, you have incentive to do it. Because if I do not have incentive, I will not do it. But that is a win-win proposal. Then it's very important to the Africa experience to talk about the profit sharing and then setting to the tariffs to do the investment that are needed. Okay, next. Okay, next. I'm going to show very, very clear examples of the experience in NL in the sustainability, how we involve the people. Again, if we involve the people, the government will support us all the decisions because we are working for everybody. Okay, we work for everybody. Huh? The first is the Fundación Pachacutec in Peru. We use in the most poor areas of Lima, people, there are areas without, without light, without water. Uh, we propose to them uh, make a university there to prepare these people to work in our operations. The second is EcoNL in Brazil that uh, wins a prize, won a prize 15 years ago in the United Nations. We exchange the garbage from the people to light. Then if you bring this garbage, you have a discount of the light and the people goes a lot until the, the, the count is zero. It's very interesting, the, the uh, psychological point I'm going to explain. The third is Luz Parados. Brazil wants to be not hungry, remember that law of Mr. Lula, and then energy for everybody, then a lot of incentives to the investor like us to collect every 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 person in the areas of the rural areas so you need to make an investment is a combination between tariff private investor and the incentive of the government and final how we construct the substation in colombia sharing value with all the community and in that case the community support the investment we want that the community understand that we are there constructing something to better and then we need to involve in a lot of variables that we're going to explain next what is the Fundación Pachacutec? 20 years ago, more or less, we make a lot of uh, sense in the poor areas in the, in the limit of Lima, Lima, Peru, that are prepared for our lives because we operate all the lives in these cities. And in the case of Lima, we operate Lima. And we need to do this with contractors in the area to do uh, the service, let me say, maintenance and preventing and, 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 and of the failure issues. No? The people there, we prepare from the schools, we graduate them, and then we assume in the contractist, and uh, let me say third uh, contractist, that we operate that. It's very important because all the government support the idea that the poor people in the area, that the rural, are preparing to work in the lines in all the uh, limb and the lime issue. It's very important then, prepare the people in the poor areas to work in our facilities. This is a very good example that get also a lot of prices in, in, in Peru. Next. The second is the garbage uh, to energy bill. This is very important, very important, because we decide how to reduce the tariff of, uh, let me say, in favelas, no? in the slums, on the people in the rural areas. If they are going to give a subsidy only, or they maybe make a little effort on that. And if the discussion was that like that 20 years ago. The people sometimes has the voluntary and the desire to do it something. And then we start to put an account with a bill. It's a, it's a credit card like that. If the people brings the, uh, let me say, uh, let me say the, the paper, 
or gives it this bottle of plastic, and a, an external company transform this money and put in the account of the people the discount in energy. Then the psychological effect was impressive. All the people in these, let me say, slums and also in the rural area, brings more and more garbage until the count was zero. Huh? It was impressive. So the people go there, all the family, the grandfather, the wife, the sister, until the count was zero. And then they say, no, it's zero, right? it's for free, no? It's very impressive. A lot of garbage, I mean, three million in bonus, 70,000 of tons. 600 people were benefited in our concession in Coelze. Impressive. It is was one of the prices in, in your, the United Nations people. You can do it. The next. And the last one, Luz para Todos. Brazil connects more than 50 million in the country, and we connect more than 2 million in the north with the government that put the energy to this type of people. Look at the people that. This is the typical customer that we have in the north of Brazil. No? They are very, very, let me say, honest people. They like to have the energy. They appreciated the energy when they come, and then the effort with the governor and us, we arrived with the lights, and they pay, they all them pay the energy. It was incredible. When you help the people to have access to the energy, they appreciate it, and they pay. That is incredible. It's incredible how they uh, react from this uh, subsidy from the government and we how we invest. Okay, the last one is ECOS in the in Colombia. The next is the Colombia issue that I'm finishing now. When we construct, and this was one year ago, when we construct a big substation in the in the borders of the in the Colombia city, we operate Bogota, all Bogota. It is more or less uh, eight million people. Um, there we propose to the community before we construct all the issues to be involved that we are going to reforesting the area that we are going to change. We are going to train the people for sure in the garbage and also in the recycle issues and also in the community to do, uh, let me say, the efficiency in your houses. We are going to put street art. You are seeing the street art, no? We allowed in Absol Station the street art, the people express what they think about the sustainability and about the green issue, and they start to put the street out in the substation. That is in a, in a public photo, it's a real photo. And then all the waste that we use there, they recycle into furniture in the area. What was the effect? The effect was totally positive. The community, for sure, allows and appreciated and welcomed the investment when you involve them. Huh? Then this is the way to do it sustainable, huh? to the, answering to my colleagues. Okay. I'm finishing the last part and the last five minutes. Excuse me for being so um, so slow, but I want to explain very, very clear. Uh, this is the Rio de Janeiro, the area Copacabana with the slums in the, in the behind. Um, Roberto, excuse me, are more or less what you, what you mentioned in the number 17. The next slide is, uh, Okay, this is a spaghetti. These are the lines in Rio de Janeiro in the slums. We put a cat there because the cat, uh, they call the cat the people who still steal the energy. You know, that is the cat issue. Um, then, how we educate the people who steal the energy in Rio, you need to educate with a lot of programs. So, it's better to educate it than to put technical, uh, let me say, measure. To avoid the steal of the energy, yeah? it's a very important discussion that we can make Roberto in another meeting. Huh? So it's not only a technical issue to solve the, the steel. You need to also to educate them. Huh? This is spaghetti showed how the lines are there in this type of favelas. Huh? The next was uh, the Nairobi, huh? and the next. This is very close to Sao Paulo. We have Sao Paulo the same. Huh? Okay, what is the first step? What they did when we entered in a market? The first step is to reduce the losses. We can reduce the losses due to technical issues or due to the um, culture issues. We, we teach the people how to do it, to not steal, and also to save the energy. And this is a very free step that we, we have a lot of experience on that. For example, in Lima, when we bought in 1995, we reduced to uh, maybe 600 base points in, uh, in four years. The same in Bogota. The same in Santiago, 
the Chile, the same in Rio de Janeiro, Buenos Aires, no? Then the first issue that you need to do, let me say, a concession, start to uh, modern, is to reduce the losses with the collaboration of the government, with not only technical um, measures, but with educating the people. Then 40% of reduction in all the concessions, very important in this capital that are in Latin America. Next. We have all these uh, capitals we operated, no? The last is digital efficiency. I'm finalizing, and, and thank you, Roberto, for the invitation again. Thank you always to all the uh, Rest for Africa organization gives to us the possibility to change our thoughts and to express what we believe every day here in the concession areas. Uh, the physical and technology issue are helping a lot the tariff and the quality in the very important markets. We're going to show only one graph. Please go directly to the, the graph of the Spanish and Italian reduction. Is there a more? No, it's the name is 24. Go to the 24 graph of the action of cost and the quality. Next. I'm finalizing, uh, colleagues. So, next. That's terrific. Okay. And uh, thank you very much. This is uh, my last slide. And thank you always for that. And let's go to the real experience. Here we have 45 million customers. Okay. 45 million customers. That may be 150 million people. Okay. Is half of Spain. We have already half of Spain with 90% of Italy and 45 million customers, 150 million people, a lot. What we did in Italy, first of all, we start in look for the curve of Italy, introducing the smart meeting, a lot of discussion in all the market, but Enel do not discuss, Enel did it, put the meeting in Italy, deploy 32 million smart meetings, then put the network automation, second step, your network, network automation, automation of the network needs to be dynamic, close, open, open, close, there is failure, close, open, close. Then the intelligence in the network, first we put intelligence on the deployment of the people, movement, movement on the operations with an intelligent brain central, meaning you need to go there, you need to prevent over there. Then intelligent network, intelligent deployment, and finally we put an optimization in the process to read, to collect, and to break. We put the same technology, and that is the result, my friends. Locally, reduce 40% the operational cost. 40%. Increase the quality, 60%. And Spain, we did the same. 2009, we deployed Hansen of operations, smart meeting, network automation, workforce optimization, technology commerce. And let me say, in three, four years, we reduced. 40% the cost and increase 30% the quality. Then it's possible, my colleagues, and I'm feeling finalizing here. Thank you to for the invitation to everybody. More technical, more technology, more quality, more efficient, and less study. Thank you very much to my colleagues. Thank you, Marcello. Thank you very much. I do completely agree with you that the experience, the expertise of Enel Group will help a lot the development of a renewable energy system in Africa. Uh, I take the chance once again to remind the 15th of July we will launch the new cluster of activity of Rest for Africa Foundation, Foundation which is called uh, Grids for Africa and uh, I'm sure that Enel Group will be involved uh, really a lot in this new cluster of activities. Thank you very much once again Marcello. Now it's uh, the time to go to another very interesting topic, which is the future of green fertilizer for the development of Africa. Here we have Jay Dobry, Product Portfolio Manager of Stami Carbon. Good morning, Joey, and the floor is you. It's your, and it's really a pleasure to have you with us today. Yes, uh, good morning. Uh, on behalf of uh, Mitre Technimont and uh, let's say all the sister companies, uh, I'm very happy to uh, be able to present this, uh, this beautiful uh, development that uh, the group has been initiating uh, for a green nitrate fertilizer plant in Kenya based on renewable electricity. 
the project is led by our development arm of the group, which is uh, called MEDEF. Uh, hence also this, uh, this presentation is um, on behalf of uh, MED Development. And uh, I'm presenting on the sides of um, uh, Sami Kaven, which is the technology licensor, also on behalf of the group in this project from Sittard in the Netherlands. If we go to the next slide, we can see um, a small overview of this presentation. I will first briefly, uh, with three slides, uh, indicate the, um, uh, the presence of the group in, uh, let's say, the green uh, area and also the group itself. And then we will go to the details of the project uh, in order to give you a flavor of how green fertilizer production is um, yeah, present today in our portfolio and that we can also, uh, we also see uh, commercial projects um, uh, feasible already today based on uh, electricity. So if you go to the next slide, uh, the Meide Technical Group, uh, many of you probably are very well uh, aware with the group, but to give, uh, let's say, a small overview, um, in the overview you see the operating companies, um, which is uh, Neosia Renewables and Nextem, our green chemistry arm, and development, our development arm, Stami Carbon, technology licensor for fertilizer uh, technologies uh, such as urea, nitric acid and uh, ammonia, KT, magnetic technology and uh, our main EPC contract with Technimont. Uh, this presentation is focused on two of the main pillars that we have in the group. One is fertilizers and the second is uh, the green chemistry uh, and also the use of renewables. If you look at, uh, let's say, the, yeah, the way the group typically works is that we are um, uh, focused on technology and technology implementation in an um, execution-driven business towards EPC. So from the beginning to the end, we are able to deliver projects uh, with the latest and also the best technology in class. Going to the next slide. Um, Looking at, let's say, uh, the leadership that we uh, try to uh, indicate as a group, um, there's a huge effort now being made in the green energy field. Um, if you, for example, uh, look and we take a sidestep to the petrochemicals, we have, uh, for example, initiatives on waste uh, gasification, which is uh, in, in various parts of the world uh, a problem, waste, and we try to convert it into uh, derivatives. Uh, one of the projects we are also incorporating is to convert waste with gasification to its fertilizer in order to have a more uh, valuable asset uh, while not having the need to use um, a natural gas for example as a feedstock but use waste as an um, yeah as, an, as a problem and solve it by converting it towards derivatives like for example fertilizers but you can also think about methanol in the area of the fertilizers, um, this is where uh, Sami Carbon has a major tr track record as the, um, let's say, main technology licensor in the field of uh, urea, uh, urea granulation, but also uh, entering into uh, nitric acid, nitrate fertilizers, and uh, green ammonia, uh, as announced in a press release earlier this year. If you look at the track records from the group, in terms of urea uh, projects, combined licensing, combined EPC, it is uh, enormous. So uh, we have quite some experience uh, in this area. Looking further down the road, um, we also focus, for example, uh, via our sister company Nextgem on renewable diesel, which is a um, quite interesting development in the area, bioethanol, but also um, some of the other technologies that we have in our hands is to convert existing technologies and i'm referring for example to the electric blue uh, hydrogen production way that we electrify our uh, smr steam methane reforming in order to have a lower carbon footprint for um, uh, yeah, chemicals which are typically produced uh, based on um, uh, natural gas or uh, let's say carbon-based feedstock so there is a lot of uh, investment being done, uh, a huge patent portfolio, uh, large investments, um, yeah, around uh, 56 uh, million euros of investments in innovation, um, major uh, as a contribution towards the green area and also to reduce carbon footprint of existing industries. Talking about green, in the next slide, we have an overview of projects that we currently have in our hands. Um, some people say that uh, the green um, the green topic is far away. Uh, we don't believe that. Uh, and also here you can already see some of the projects that we have in our hands towards go to in, uh, green hydrogen, but also towards green ammonia 
and uh, this project, which is uh, that we let's say uh, have announced uh, and which we will clarify in this presentation for Kenya, is even one step further going uh, to green fertilizers. Also, in the basis, uh, let's say here. Uh, hydrogen is a very strong, uh, let's say, pillar of the group, and also the track record here is um, is enormous. Uh, if you look at uh, the track record from hydrogen towards ammonia, also there, uh, there is already a quite an established base. So, um, yeah, we can leverage that in order to make the next step and also move towards a more greener uh, environment. Going in the, in the next uh, slide, we enter the project. So, the project that we would like to highlight, um, which uh, I believe fits very well in this um, in this uh, webinar on, uh, let's say, strategic moves towards uh, the African continent, and going to the next slide directly into the into the project, we have uh, here shown some, uh, let's say, slides, and uh, I will go through them one by one, indicating the, let's say, the concept and the rough um, surroundings of the project, why uh, this is. Uh, an interesting project and uh, why we are committed to bring this to a commercial implementation. This uh, initiative is uh, carried by our development arm, MET Development, and it's supported by the sister companies, Sami Carbon for Technology Supply, NextGen for Technology and EPC Supply. And we have already commenced, let's say, the, um, the early engineering phase to build this renewable power to fertilizer plant in Kenya. In order to do so, you need to have local partners, uh, which is essential uh, in, um, in, in Africa. And here we have uh, collaborated with uh, Osirian Development Company, which is a, a development uh, company which uh, has a land and an industrial park close to uh, Kenjan a geothermal uh, power facility, which we will uh, use the out let's say the power generated uh, from this plant to, um, to provide as feedstock for this fertilizer plant. The development consortium consists of international but also of course local partners um, and for example you can consider local offtake. Uh, fertilizer is a, is a big, yeah, big issue in terms of availability and affordability and I'll come back to that. And hence, we would like to make sure that all fertilizer is uh, finding its way to the local market, since there is a huge need for um, more and also um, uh, fertilizer available in the right time. But also the plant needs to be operated and therefore you need to have uh, experience with how to operate the plant in the fields. So therefore we have a mix of international but also local partners. The, the schedule now is that we would like to see plant startup in 2023. Also, it's quite interesting to know that uh, this is a smaller size plant, but the EPC trajectory is quite fast compared to big facilities. So that was also providing a more, let's say, better contribution towards uh, a change that we need to establish um, yeah, in due time. For example, at the milestones in 2030, they can be met with this type of projects. This specific project is uh, going to use and consume renewable power and that is going to, uh, let's say, generate fertilizer. And the capacity is 550 metric tons per day, uh, calcium ammonia nitrate, which is a uh, fertilizer used in the local uh, market, or it has the capability to switch towards MPK fertilizers, which are also consumed in the local marketplace. It will be the first of its kind. So it's um, the difference with many of the other projects that uh, that are announced is that this is a commercial project. So it will drive on its own. It will uh, be commercial and it will uh, be in, let's say, compelling business case, which is different than, let's say, subsidized projects um, that cannot sustain themselves. This is where it needs to uh, make the difference by bringing a sustainable business case. And the technology will be based uh, on semi carbon technology for a large extent. In the next slide, um, so roughly what uh, distinguishes this plant is that it will be powered from, uh, let's say, uh, an electricity coming from uh, a grid, mainly from the geothermal uh, power facility next door, but also compensated and supported with some solar energy, which will be produced on site. And it is fully replacing the need for carbon for this type of fertilizer. So there is no carbon in the production and there is no need to um, to see any carbon to produce this type of fertilizers, which is something which is, trying, uh, I believe, quite unique and the first of its kind. Also, considering the local contribution, because that is something we must not forget, is that it will generate a substantial amount of jobs in the area. 
and also solves a major problem because it will make fertilizer uh, available for local farm holders. A very positive side effect is we will reduce a substantial amount of carbon compared to conventional manufacturing based on natural gas. Uh, 100,000 tons of CO2 is foreseen uh, to be reduced compared to a uh, conventional way uh, of manufacturing this type of fertilizer. And for a country like Kenya, it also reduces their dependency of imports. And uh, depending on the, the numbers uh, you use, but we, uh, we assume that, um, that it's around 800 uh, kilotons on an annual basis. This plant, although it's not very big, it's relatively small, but it already replaces 25% of the, of the imports of fertilizers in Kenya, meaning it's a major contribution uh, for its, uh, independ the, to be independent of, um, yeah, of the, the world flow of fertilizers. And that touches a very important uh, item, which is important for the, let's say, small scale farmers and also the local offtake. Because the fertilizers need to come from, for example, the Middle East, but sometimes even from Europe. Uh, the availability of fertilizer in this area is a huge problem because fertilizers need to be available on the right time in the, in the season of the crop. If it is not available, there's no need to apply it because it's simply useless. So it needs to be available. And due to the long uh, distance of the supply chain, this is uh, a problem to get it on time. It's also a problem because um, you can stock fertilizer, but that only increases the price of fertilizers. And also the affordability is, a uh, let's say, a hurdle that we would like to bridge by bringing domestic fertilizer production to the heartland of Kenya. And in addition, it will contribute to, let's say, a low carbon, but also a growth, a growth of the agricultural outputs, because one of the, uh, another uh, issue in the, uh, and that's, that accounts for the entire, uh, of most of the, uh, the African continent is the low application rates. Uh, this might solve it because the availability of fertilizer will uh, automatically increase the uh, application rates as availability makes farmers access the fertilizer and also uh, profit from higher crop yields. So uh, in that sense, local production solves many of these uh, matters uh, and in a certain extent, since we are only replacing part of the, um, of the, uh, of the imports. But Besides the fact that it's a renewable project, but also the fact that it's local production uh, is a major contributor for the area. Taking to the next uh, slide, the, uh, provides an overview of, let's say, the rough uh, uh, figures of the showcase. So plant capacity are already mentioned. It's uh, like 550 metric tons per day, which we can switch between calcium ammonia nitrate um, and various grades of NPK. Total investment, roughly 300 million uh, is our first, uh, let's say, estimate, but the engineering phase that we are now concluding um, after summer uh, will confirm uh, this, this figure in order to enter into the next phase. Power consumption, um, it's a roughly 70 to 80 megawatts that we will consume on this site. Eight hectares, not very big, it's actually very small plants. And uh, yeah, substantial amount of uh, CO2 reduction that can be generated compared to uh, natural gas based production. If we go to the next slide, it's an, uh, it provides an overview of the, uh, how this uh, roughly uh, looks like. So I don't want to go to too much technical details, but um, what we are going to do is we are going to take the electricity from um, geothermal uh, infrastructure, solar, which is on site. Um, but also uh, connected to the grid, because um, Kenya has also quite some abundant uh, wind resources. That is going to be um, produced, uh, producing the hydrogen via electrolysis, combined with uh, nitrogen generated with an electric driven uh, air separation unit, we produce uh, with semiconductor technology green ammonia. With the green ammonia, we can produce the nitric acid. The nitric acid produces ammonia nitrate, which is accordingly being converted to calcium ammonia nitrate in order to have a safe product. Uh, since ammonia nitrate, um, yeah, it, it, it has a track record uh, since it can also be used for explosives, but converting it to calcium ammonia nitrate makes it, uh, makes it a safe product again. But in addition, it can also be converted to NPKs, which we uh, rely our partner INCRO uh, from Spain uh, or that is supporting us for the finishing part of the plant. All in all, integrated plant, quite sophisticated, latest technology, and uh, able to produce highly efficient, also compared to large-scale production. 
in the next phase, uh, in the next slide, um, we have provided a slight overview on the exact location. Uh, why Kenya is, uh, of course, an important question. Well, uh, Kenya has, a, let's say, a unique situation. And there is, uh, of course, a very good reason why we are in Kenya. Most of the electricity produced in Kenya today is already renewable, meaning that they have a track record and experience with using renewable electricity and know very well uh, how to consume that. In addition, it's also a large market for the type of fertilizer that we intend to produce, the calcium ammonia nitrate, and it's now being imported. So that's, uh, that's another feature. And even though we also see that, uh, that this plant would already meet uh, a large extent of the existing local market, we also reckon that, um, that when bringing fertilizer production uh, to the area, it will, by definition, create more demand and hence also stimulate agricultural development. Kenya has a stable investment climate, very important. It's, um, uh, it has also high logistical costs, as mentioned before especially on the location where we are. If you go more to the heartland of, the, um, of Africa, uh, also to the, to the Lake District, you see that, um, that transportation costs are going to kick in and contribute substantially to the cost of fertilizer, which is all being paid by uh, local and, uh, let's say, small-scale farmers. This is an item that we solve by bringing a local production there. And it's a strategic orientation of the Kenyan government, uh, for which also the support has been granted to yeah, be more, uh, let's say, uh, uh, self-steering and less dependent of uh, imported fertilizer. Another nice feature, and that is also very helpful, is that they already have an overcapacity of electricity, meaning that, um, that bringing consumers for electricity to, to Kenya will also further improve the development of the grid. And, uh, and these are connected, uh, let's say, uh, committed in long-term PPA, so that's also something that we can utilize. If you look at the availability of solar, uh, wind, and also the geothermal uh, power supply, uh, you would see that it's an, uh, an ideal location and uh, perfect suitable to operate a chemical plant, which, uh, which an ammonia plant is. And that is slightly different than only focusing on hydrogen, because hydrogen you can easily or more easily produce from uh, it emitted um, energy sources, which for ammonia is more difficult because um, you would like to have it as a, as a plant that is producing continuously and not uh, having to be able to compel with uh, intermittent energy sources. Going to the next slides, uh, it's um, uh, the technology that is being used. Um, technology for these small scale plants is not, uh, was not readily available. Samikaden has, uh, let's say, a partnership in which we developed our own uh, green ammonia technology for small scale ammonia plants. Um, uh, today we are focusing on 100 and 200 metric tons per day of, uh, of ammonia, which equals around 35 to 70 megawatt of power. And uh, this ammonia can be used as an energy factor, as a fuel, uh, but of course we prefer to use it for more uh, higher added value end product like fertilizers. And um, we use a technology which is very small, it's very, uh, it's even scalable, so we can even go to higher capacities if desired, and we use um, let's say reference plants which are in operation today and on the small pictures below you can see uh, two 90 well actually three 90, 90 metric tons per day plants which are natural gas based in operation but they follow the same principle it's a very lean design reducing the capex, uh, capex in order to have an uh, efficient return on your investments for the small size and um, as we are let's say technology company also focused um, uh, on digitization, uh, as also our, uh, let's say, the whole company, uh, Maritechnimont, is focused on digitization. We will also bring in our latest digital uh, tools, meaning that um, to train our local operators, we have operator trainer simulators available that can train operators from the electricity supply to hydrogen uh, production via electrolysis to green ammonia, nitric acid production, and accordingly uh, the final product, calcium ammonia nitrate or NPKs. It is important to have local uh, operators available, but also educated. And uh, digitization starts with education. So uh, in that sense, we bring these tools to the plant as we are, uh, let's say, present ourselves. In addition, uh, Kenya is far away uh, from any um, uh, yeah, technology license or any support that can uh, help in case of upsets or problems. 
So also we are going to install our, um, our process monitor, which is an online monitoring system for which uh, expert support is available within a button. So you can do it via Teams, um, it's an, via an internet browser, we can provide, uh, let's say, assistance from uh, remote from, from here, from SITAT, for example, that uh, if there are offsets or if there are um, yeah, discrepancies in production, we can notice and we can actually proactively uh, provide solutions in order to keep the plant running. Because at the end, the plant needs to run in order also to generate return, and that would actually also, uh, it's important to have a compelling business case. We would utilize our nitric acid technology, which is reckoned as one of the most, uh, say, energy efficient ones in the world. Uh, and let's say when moving to the next slides, we are coming to the summary of this uh, of this uh, presentation. Um, in the mindset, green, green hydrogen, maybe not, but green ammonia, green fertilizers seems to be far away, but it is actually not. Technology is available today, and um, we are going to prove it here. Uh, so we have, let's say, taken our initiative ourselves, we are driving the project and uh, to bring renewable fertilizer production to Kenya. It is a showcase and it also illustrates a little bit of, let's say, the developments that will come in the future because there will be a new way for fertilizer production, also for ammonia production towards fuels, towards um, uh, as an energy carrier, carrier and this is a very good example of where you see a sneak, sneak peek of the future on how that would look like. It will also be the first of its kinds which will commence a commercial operation uh, for green nitrate fertilizers and uh, for us this is just the beginning um, because we reckon that this concept can be multiplied uh, several times in this area and maybe also across borders towards the heartland uh, of the region uh, for example around Lake Victoria for example. With this, uh, I would like to end, uh, let's say, the presentation and hope you uh, you enjoyed our um, yeah our initiative also to contribute and to commit ourselves towards uh, let's say a green future uh, which doesn't stop with hydrogen. It also uh, it also can be like Thank you very much, Joey. It's really interesting, and I think that the experience of uh, stomach carbon in Kenya will be a kind of uh, accelerator for other similar experience, a kind of, uh, uh, yes, accelerators of uh, similar experience in other parts of Africa. Really very interesting. Yes, Thank also you. the because the electricity also needs to be developed. So it will also give, give a boost to uh, local electricity uh, developments, um, which is now a little bit difficult because you have an oversupply. So bringing consumers there, it, it solves multiple problems. So it, actually it is a no brainer, but uh, somebody has to do it. Somebody has to lead. And uh, that is why uh, yeah, as a group, we have, let's say, taken all the competences in our group together uh, to make this type of initiatives possible. Yeah, that's why before you, we spoke about grids. Now we spoke about uh, green fertilizer and the next, uh, the next uh, speech will be about renewable energy. That's how you say this three, three of a kind, but must go, must act together to speed up the energy revolution the, and uh, evolution of Africa. Thank you very much, Joey. You're welcome. Now, I was speaking about the next uh, speech is the, about the future of renewable energy, the, we can say the, the core of the energy transition. Today with us, with us we have uh, Hernando Castillo, head of uh, hybrid system at uh, Siemens Gamesa, and from him we, we will be very, very, very happy, very interesting, would be very interesting to hear from him how how to say the renewable energy system will contribute to this uh, evolution of energy infrastructure. Good morning, Hernando. It's uh, nice to have uh, you with us today. The floor is yours. Hello, uh, good morning. And, and Carlo, as you said, uh, very, thank you very much for the invitation. And also, uh, as you mentioned, there's a very good transition between one on, and the other presentations we're having right now, because yes, everything is completely linked to this um, to this new world we're we are uh, building right now. Uh, the renewables are now the present, not the future, 
And as you will see uh, in my presentation, we are working hard to, to, to bring the re renewables uh, worldwide. So please, next slide. And, and the next one, I will make a short presentation of our company for the ones who, who don't know us. Well, uh, we are here to bring renewables with our tremendous capabilities. Uh, and please, next slide. That's our, our CEO. Uh, Andreas Nauen, and as you can see, and maybe you know, or oh, were uh, after the um, the join between Siemens and Gamesa, well, we we have a huge company uh, that work worldwide, installed more than 100 gigawatts, and we are more than 26,000 uh, people working in different departments. Please, next slide. And we are uh, we are in three different business units: onshore offshore and and service um and and all the businesses are focused on this in this transition from non-renewables to renewables and also you will see that uh, we focus right now in on hybrids please next slide next one oh well as as roberto mentioned at the beginning of of this uh meeting today well the biggest problem that uh, would be shown uh, to the renewables at the beginning of, of this uh, decade is, is the stability and predictability of the renewables. As you may know, we depend on the resources, we depend on the wind, we depend on the solar, and, and we see that our contribution to, to be sustainable need some um, uh, improvements. If we produce just wind stand along with the pen on wind, if we produce produce just solar, we depend on the solar radiation. But uh, we we um, we want to focus on the combination of both and the combination with some storage. So in case of weak grids, that is is very useful in some countries in Africa, in Australia, in India. All what we can offer with this combination is that we help not only the grid but also the new renewable sources we are including in the grid so um at the beginning it was treated as something that complicated the situation of one grid but right now with the uh, hybrid systems it can help the stability and predictability not only of the sources but also to the grids and we are cost efficient as you know so next slide please Well, uh, I, I prepare a different uh, presentation for, for this case. We will talk about the methods, how we combine uh, the hybrids. We'll talk our solutions on hybrid or uh, on storage, uh, the solutions that we have in Siemens Gamesa. Uh, well, we will, I will talk so about the clipping and the power variation. And well, some projects we carry out, okay, the EMS solutions. And uh, well, what what can we do for for um, not only the grids and the power but also some other industries as Joey mentioned before to supply this uh, renewable energy and at the end of this presentation I will talk some um, I will say some points about the hydrogen production we're focused right now so next slide please so how do we design a hybrid uh, project well it's, it's it's complex okay it's not a easy thing and that's why uh, well regarding that we are experienced in in sizing um uh, wind uh, farms we know we have a team that has the knowledge to size solar but this is not just add one to the other we need to interact and to to see uh the real needs of our customers because uh, there are some that well uh they need 24 7 okay so we we need to size uh, um, uh, as we call it round the clock situations, but there are some other cases that we can follow and have some some um, uh, not hundred percent dependence on on the load, and we can uh, size this for uh, minimize the capex of of this break. So it depends on we make some different simulations. We can make wind plus PV, uh, wind plus PV, and cover peak situations around the clock as i mentioned before some other special boundary conditions and and also well off-grid completely off-grid situations where we will need in some cases to add some 
uh, existing non-renewables to the renewables to um, minimize the capex. But uh, in most of cases, we can we can size perfectly the renewable sources, and and we have different tools that we develop internally, and also HiSIM that's been developed with DNDGL to size these these um, hybrid systems. So we have these capabilities to help our customers in this. Next slide, please. So our, our internal tool is 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 a um, technical financing tool. Uh, that uh, finds the most effective and profitable solution for customers is it, it has very iterations internally and well first step is to see the re the wind resource we have the solar resource we have we make the first um, iterations and we see if it's uh, interesting in terms of LCOE IRR and MPV okay once we see this and we see that could be interesting for for a customer or for the industry will use this energy we make some other simulations to modify the first step of wind and solar to get the maximum of them together okay so uh, this is not adding uh, wind standalone and solar standalone and let them like that what we do is to modify afterwards uh, the maximum generation during the year and or depending on the case minimizing the emittency we'll have during the year Next slide, please. So this is this is uh, the tool uh, that we developed together with DMVGL, and the main difference with or the other tool for Wind Plus PV is that we interact a lot with uh, storage. You have a very good knowledge of storage, as you will see afterwards, uh, from our 100% owned company, Gamesa Electric, that's been producing solar inverters in the past, and right now they use this knowledge to produce also uh the power electronics for uh bi-directional inverters for uh storage so lithium storage is, is is a part of our company as well and all this knowledge has been uh used in this simulation tool where we can calculate cash flow depending on the services we participate so we're not selling just energy but we're selling also some ancillary services to the grid okay depending on the regulation of each country these services can be paid or not there are some cases where these services are not paid, but are a condition to participate with our renewable sources. So, uh, well, we are able to calculate the revenues we'll have from these services. Next slide, please. So, uh, in general, the assumptions we do uh, for size um, storage system is, well, the day ahead uh, uh, markets we will participate, the rated energy, the capacity, um, and may, for example, for a five megawatts, uh, two hours, okay, contract capacity, the install capacity is a little bit higher because we have always losses. So if you have, uh, well, between the net and, and the grow, uh, gross uh, values, we have a difference because it, this, these are the losses, but the most important what we do in, in with this simulation is to calculate very very well um, uh, the life of the battery and the use of this battery you know uh, you may know very well because everyone has a cell phone that depending on how you charge and discharge the battery life will change so it's very important for these energy uh, systems that are huge but at the end of the day there are um, um, a lot of small batteries together in a container uh we need to take care of these uh batteries and how we use them so that's why uh the first sizing is very important for uh the capex and opex of this project because we need we should need maybe augmentations during the life of the project maybe at seven years maybe at 10 years depending on how we go deep in this discharge and how we use this energy so it's not just um okay i add some battery and and all my curtailment will go from here to there no, it has a cost, it has a life of the battery. So we need to calculate this before uh, and to reflect it into uh, IRR values. Next slide, please. So uh, as I mentioned before, you see uh, degradation curves, okay? And the state of life, uh, of health of, of these batteries. So. Uh, well, I, I can share this this presentation afterwards, but you can see this is a very very important calculations calculations we need to do much before starting the project. Next slide, please. 
So what's our, our offer uh, from, from Siemens Gamesa? Uh, well, not only wind, not only uh, also uh, solar inverters, but we have containerized solutions for, for storage, okay? Uh, we integrate in-house uh, third-party uh, DC uh, um, cells for storage to so lithium, and we have our own power electronics that were where we containerize uh, with uh, transformer, with uh, with um, uh, switch gear, and also we have this is the most important. Uh, we have a controller for the whole system. Okay, what we call HPC hybrid plant controller, where um, this is the intelligent part of 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 the integration where you maximize uh, the use of the battery, but as well the resource you have. You can have information for the forecast for the next hours, cloud coming and the change of the wind. And we can assume the best use of the battery and, and to maximize the life of this battery. Okay, next slide, please. So uh, batteries, there are many and very different solutions. So we, I, I like this uh, this uh, arrow because it can show the different uses of the battery. So for seconds, okay, we can have batteries similar to condensators that will solve some frequency response problems. Okay, very fast frequency response problems can be solved by the battery, not only by the capacitor. Okay, and also some voltage control. From seconds to minutes, okay, we can share this use of frequency control and secondary frequency control with other uses. But if we talk, start to talk about minutes, okay, we have ramp control, okay, it's very typical in wind and, and solar with a lot of clouds come, you have a rundown of this energy, it may can be compensated because the grid will not accept this, okay. And, and when we start talking about one, two hours, up to three hours, lithium is working very well and it can bring some other energy arbitrage solutions or capacity firming intraday uh, if you or uh, your regulator uh, need this and, and well, you can offer this capacity to the grid in case, you, okay, you keep me uh, from seven to eight in the afternoon, uh, one, two, three megawatts because uh, our grid is having problems all the, all, all the days with this. So this is another service that our batteries can, can offer up to the two or three hours, okay? Up to four hours, it's possible to have lithium batteries, but it starts to be competitive also, uh, the flow batteries we're working with, but the, right now they're not commercial, but in the next years, Camisa Electric will start offering also um, flow batteries. So next slide, please. So, uh, well, uh, what's the biggest difference between the different uh, hybrid systems? I, maybe today hybrid means a lot, but we need to split the level of integration we have on hybrid. So maybe we can have um, a farm, okay, wind farm, solar farm, where we have different installations, okay? We have standalone installations with different connection points in the same place, okay? That's what we call standalone. But there are some other that are collocated, so they have the same con connection point. So there's the first level of integration. Okay, this is not intelligent. They're just located in the same place and go to the same connection point. Okay, so you need just one permit for that, but they're working independently. Okay, so in this case, it could happen. Okay, this is the most usual of cases of of uh, hybrid systems right now. It could happen that you can have um, wind energy, solar energy, okay, but the storage is bringing energy as well. So there's not, there's no intelligence there. Um, the grid is, is requesting energy and all the people is, is bringing this. So the hybrid solutions is what we call 100% integration. It's where you have a smart part that is a controller that manage all the devices. So in our case, the HPC goes not only to the wind farm controller, the solar controller, or the storage control. It goes to each of one turbines, each of one solar inverters, each of one PCS, okay, to see the situation we're in. And also, it receives information from 
the TSO DSO. So he knows what the grid needs. So we can be at the same time bringing some services to the grid because they need some frequency response and generating er energy from wind and stopping the solar because there's a ramp down because of the clouds are coming. Okay, so it's, it's, it's very, very, very intelligent and is maximizing the energy that we bring to the grid, but also most important, the health of this energy, the quality of this energy to the grid. Okay, because the grids are weak. There are some cases where the grid needs some uh, situations that are not just energy and frequency response are, uh, you need to stop, but not the wind farm at whole. We need to, to stop some parts of the wind farm to stop uh, some parts of the solar. And maybe we can work kind of uh, island mode where you use all your renewable energy to store in the battery and afterwards you bring it to the grid. Okay, so we, come, we, we take into account all these situations uh, and we, uh, we uh, bet for the 100% hybridized system. Next slide, please. So it's more or less what I said before, uh, grid stability, energy services, and the grid code compliance depend on if you choose standalone, collocated, and hybridized. And we see that 100% hybridized is the best solution for all of them. Next slide, please. So, uh, well, our experience comes from 2007 where we uh, installed a hybrid system in the Galapagos Island in, in, in Ecuador. There were uh, diesel gens, okay, and we installed wind farm, a wind farm close to them, and we made them interact, okay, intelligently. So, um, afterwards, we start with the thermal energy storage in Hamburg, but in 2015, we use our knowledge from this island tests for our La Plana prototype plant that uh, well, we keep on working in, in there because this is our test plant. And this is where we, at, at that time, we work off grid with uh, three decent gens, one wind turbine and solar and lithium storage. Uh, but for now, we keep on, we keep on working um, uh, with weak grids and other tests uh, when, when we, uh, uh, use different sources of energy, uh, wind, solar. We're trying to use another wind, another wind turbines uh, near to the one that we use. And also uh, we are testing flow batteries there. And we check all the different weak grids we have worldwide. We check all the grid codes and before going to a market. So uh, this is the, the place where we test our hybrid plant controller and this intelligence I talked before. In 2017, we have our first uh, test uh, wind plus PV plant in India, and, and one year after, we first our first commercial project uh, with 28.8 uh, 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 megawatts uh, solar plus 50 megawatts um, wind. As uh, wind, yes, and uh, well, uh, I, I will show afterwards. We make some tests after, before um the sizing and afterwards with uh, two years operation and we see that our simulations are quite good so we are finishing right now because of the covid we have a, a a little delay um the um, commissioning of of the puerto galera plant in in the mindoro island in philippines where we have 16 megawatts wind plus six megawatts one hour battery for as i mentioned before ancillary services we have uh, a weak grid because this island is connecting to uh, the main island of the country, but this connection is not so good as, as it should be. And they need some support of the battery for this wind farm. And what we do is, is ancillary services. We need uh, ramp control. Uh, we'll do uh, also uh, frequency, uh, fast frequency response and frequency response, secondary and primary. Next, uh, next slide, please. So this is the first sample, the San Cristobal project in, in Galapagos Island. Next slide. This is a, a co-located system um, that we did in, in Australia. Okay, you can see the sizes there. This is with Tesla batteries. Next slide, please. This is our La Plana plant, okay, that we're trying to um, to extend right now with more wind turbines and more solar. 
Next slide, please. This is the first project in India. Okay, two and one point seven. This was the test one. Next slide, please. And this is the commercial one I mentioned before. Next slide. This is another. Uh, this is integrated. Uh, it started as co-located, and we're integrating right now in Australia. Next slide, please. This is the ET solutions. This is for huge storage. This is a test plant in in Hamburg. Next slide, please. And this is uh, the one we're commissioning right now. Next slide, please. So, as I said before, we have uh, the, the hybrid plant control it and, and it has three different levels of, of, of control. The first one is located in the power electronics of each device, the wind turbines, uh, the solar inverters, and also the, e, the PCS, okay, that are able each of them it's, it's working uh, with their own functions, okay, but directed, um, uh, connected directly to the plant controller. Afterwards, we have this plant controller with the SCADA, okay, and, and connections with the TSO, this TSO. And we have a third level that can be um, supplied by us, but some customers want to have their own directly. But what we, in this level, we, we have information coming from the forecast. Okay, we have our colleagues from the service business unit have a service called MEGA that have a very good information of the forecast for wind and solar radiation and also market prices in case you have a regulated market and you need to uh, interact with them. Next slide, please. Service uh, business unit is completely aligned with us in, in onshore and, and what we offer is not just uh, the wind turbines and, and the solar inverters, but a service that is, is afterwards uh, helping to operate the plant. Next slide, please. So what's this service? As I said before, we have this mega service that um, gives information about the wind speed, the dynamic power, uh in real time and also some cloudiness radiation etc and how to maintain this this will help a lot to maintain uh the state of charge of the batteries if we include batteries in, the, in a project next slide please so for example this wind plus pv planting in capital in in india was tested uh just after we installed it and and we saw that well it, it's been producing um as as expected and and all what we uh sized and all what we um uh understand as as complementarity of the two sources was uh, revealed with this study so the climate timing was uh well very low and we we're happy with with these assumptions we did at the beginning of the project next slide please Because, uh, well, uh, as you can see, uh, well, next slide, because this, these are the assumptions. Uh, as you can see, well, uh, from uh, the calculated curtainment to the real uh, curtainment is, is very, very close. We, uh, we have uh, same values, more or less, and we're happy with these assumptions we did at the beginning. Next slide, please, even better. So this is how uh, the controller works. Okay, uh, you can see here more or less the, the complementarity of the sources. It generates a little bit before the sun rises in the morning. Uh, this is a typical day. Uh, this year, these are real data, and you can see how uh, the system compensates uh, and, and can add this energy, uh, the solar to the wind, and have a combined generation. Next slide, please. Here you can see how we can we can interact with the um, with the limitations that the grid uh, give to us. Okay, we can respond very fast if if the grid says okay, I I I can I you need to stop this energy, and you can see down also the very strange uh, curve we have from solar this cloudiness in this day. Okay, even we have a very good production of wind, we have cloudiness in in solar, and the grid asked us to reduce the production, we can react very fast. Next slide, please. And now I will 
give you some ideas of what we're doing on, on hydrogen because this is is uh is a topic of the day, if the topic of the year. And well, yes, we we are working in onshore and offshore and uh, to produce hydrogen from wind. Okay, but not only from wind. Um, you know, um in, in offshore, it's clear that we have very good AAP production, so it's not needed to combine wind and the intermittency is very low. So we are we are focusing in on offshore business units to have wind turbines that will produce directly the hydrogen inside the wind turbines. So this is a very innovative project. This is this is a long track, and we will see. I hope in 2025, 2027, uh, the first uh, 14 megawatts wind turbine that will produce directly not energy but hydrogen. But as in onshore. We know that the intermittency and also the energy we can generate directly from wind maybe is 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 not the best solution in most of cases. We need some other support. So that's why we combine uh, the hybrid to the hydrogen. What I mean is that we need to reduce the intermittency to help our uh, electrolyzers to be more stable. If we are off grid, completely off grid, okay, this is one of the best solutions we can have for produce um, green hydrogen. Okay, so next slide, please. So what we do is is to combine the wind and and go uh, to an electrolyzer, and well, this has been mentioned before, but we can add afterwards. We need some treatment of the water, and we can combine afterwards with nit nitrogen to produce ammonia. Okay. Uh, but in general, the, the, our intention is to combine wind plus uh, um, plus solar, and maybe it's needed in some kinds of electrolyzers, some storage, okay? Because we need um, a more stable energy. Intermittency is not the best for the electrolyzer, depending on the kind of the electrolyzer you're using. Okay. Next slide, please. So, well, we will have different kinds of of combinations. We can have uh the electrolyzer very close to the wind and solar farm the hybrid and afterwards we will need to transport this hydrogen produce and maybe the consumer will have an electric electrical consumption okay on other cases we can transport the energy to the customer and he will produce uh, the hydrogen or ammonia depending on the case okay it is there are different cases uh, ppas hpas okay and well, we're working with uh, different um, projects worldwide. Okay, we are working by our own in some cases or through Siemens Energy in other cases because they have uh, an electrolyzer solutions and they have integrated solutions as well. So depending on the case and the needs, we can work with them and and produce not only hydrogen but also ammonia. Next slide. So that's what I have to say about our, our integration on on um, hybrids and also hydrogen. Very interesting, Fernando. Thank you very much. Uh, it it really a good sign that how to say what uh, has shown before uh, Enel Global Infrastructure and Network, uh, what has shown uh, STEMI Carbons, and what has shown Siemens Gamesa go on the same direction uh, would be really a very good dream for us for africa to have a project including all these three actors all together in your presentation we can see that how to say it's not a dream it's not tomorrow could be even uh, today so it's really interesting thank you very much uh, fernando and uh, i am we are coming to to, a, to an end of this very interesting webinar uh, with the last but not least uh, presentation of, a, um, of, an, of our member uh, of an energy player very interesting like Schneider Electric and the title of the of the speech summarize the complete uh, focus of the webinar is uh, the title is shaping smart and sustainable energy infrastructure for the future of Africa we have the pleasure to have with us uh, Mohamed Nouda Zara, who is the Francophone African Digital Power Product Application Engineer of Schneider Electric. Good morning, uh, Mohamed. 
it's really a pleasure uh, welcome and it's a pleasure to have uh, with you, uh, to have with you in, uh, during this day the floor is yours thank you Hello. very much uh, thank you carlo i'm very happy to be with you today uh, so i want to thank res for africa to give us this opportunity to share uh, our knowledge with our continent africa next slide please so uh, I am Mohamed Nuhda Zahra, I am Digital Power Product Application Engineer for Francophone Africa inside Schneider Electric. Uh, next slide. So a uh, few words about uh, Schneider Electric. We are a global leader in energy management and the industrial system. We provide the digital solution for efficiency and sustainability. Our mission is uh, ensuring life is on everywhere for everyone at every moment. Next. So for uh, the agenda, I will start with uh, an introduction on the new electrical world, uh, the opportunity of smart grid in Africa, and a high overview of smart grid enablers, and finally, some use case of uh, smart grid deployment. Next. The future will be more electrical by 2030. There will be 30% more energy production due to the increase of consumption. 50% of this production will came from uh, solar and wind energies. And 50% uh, of the vehicles on the road will be electric and transportation will make up 30% of all the world's energy consumption. With this energy transformation, we will have three times more connected devices, five times more data generated from these devices, and we will need more artificial intelligence deployment. Next, please. Uh, the electric creates a future which is much better than the one we have today. And that future is going to be green. We will have more green energy, more decentralized microgrids, more net zero building and electrical vehicles. Next, please. This new future world will be redefined by the 3D plus E equation, where there is a need for more electricity, more digitalized and connected devices, more decarbonization, and finally, more decentralized resources. Please, next, please. Uh, the electrical green future start to have an impact on the energy value chain. The energy landscape is shifting from traditional grid where energy is distributed from fuel-based centralized generation to customer, to a new grid with decentralized generation where customers aren't just consuming energy, they are producing it too. The new energy landscape brings more complexity, stress, and question on how to make the power distribution reliable, safe, and secure. Please, next. Next slide, please. Major implication comes to the picture, for example, how we can benefit from the integration of DAR without impacting the grid resilience. How we can reduce the losses and supply the energy at low cost. And what if we could uh, leverage the digitization of the grid to optimize operation, planning, and make a self-immune grid. And finally, what if we could turn prosumers into partners with comprehensive behind the meter services? Next, please. The smart grid will be the answer to address the needs of the new energy landscape with its capacity to optimize the integration of the air, deliver a cost-effective power to customer, efficient distribution of electrical power, to ensure agreed reliability and quality of supply, to ensure efficiency of maintenance and operations, and finally, resilience and compliance to cybersecurity. Next, please. So, when it comes to our beautiful African continent, the starting points, challenges, and opportunities are too different from industrial countries. The massive electricity infrastructure requirement in Africa, alongside with the low ratio of access to energy, 
offer a unique opportunity to learn from great development in industrial countries, benefit from the lesson learned, and to do things right from the beginning. The key to master your grid is to design it to be smart. Also, the diversity of renewable resources in Africa will help to accelerate the integration of the air and the supply of green energy. These two opportunities together can provide a green future to Africa with a smart grid and 100% access to electricity. Next. So for smart grid, uh, there is a lot of technologies starting from sensors, intelligent devices, information and communication uh, technologies and softwares. If we take a high overview of smart grid enablers, especially for Africa, that will help us to make the green energy affordable and reliable electricity to all. We have EDMS, Advanced Distribution Management System, DERMS, Distributed energy resources management systems and finally microgrids next please next so let's start first with edms edms is a modular architecture consisting of several solutions the edms is adopted by utilities at the distribution level in order to plan and operate the network with efficiency reliability safety and security the first brick of EDMS is the SCADA. Use it to collect data from failed devices and remote control on the electrical components or equipments we have on the network. Second part is DMS, Distributed Management System. It is used for electrical network management and analysis in order to perform smart operation of organs and help the optimization of planning of the grid. Then we have the outage management system. Use it to manage the breakdowns, plan for outages, manage the field teams and customers call about the outages. Uh, power control system can be also part of EDMS, which used to monitor control of generators. And finally, one of the new important bricks of new EDMS is the DERMS. Is it used to modelize supervise, forecast, and control of distributed energy resources. Next, please. An EDMS can be integrated with other application of smart grid, like advanced metering infrastructure used for smart metering, the geographic information system, GIS, helping to have a full visibility on the component of the grid and the map, and also other solution like customer information system, enterprise asset management, data about the weather and the market prices can all be added in order to enable the full smart grid deployment. Next. So uh, the second enablers of uh, smart grid is DERMS. DERMS can be a part of an EDMS or as a standalone solution. We will talk about uh, DERMS. Next, please. Africa benefits from the diversity of renewable resources. However, the integration of these distributed energy resources will cause many challenges. Technical challenges like the increase of voltage at the customer point, the reverse of active power flow, where power can feed back to the upstream network, which is not designed for, the intermittency and uncertainty of generation versus production. We have also regulation challenges like uh, the security of supply and quality of services provided, the energy market demand, and the grid code requirements. Also with the DRR, we will have multi-technology resources that will be integrated and should be managed and maintained at high level. And finally, the need for cyber secure communication infrastructure. Next, please. So to deal with the, the electrical issues, the simplest solution adopted by many electrical company over the last year is to do nothing and to limit the, the air integration to what we call the safe level. But it is not acceptable for the future with new, new energy policy, go to green, 
mixed energy and the willingness to increase the renewable usage. DERMS comes as a solution to most of these challenges. DERMS will allow the real-time monitoring, which will help us to improve operational efficiency and the grid reliability. It will also prevent network constraints by applying voltage regulation, reduction, and also load shedding and demand response mechanism. Real time constraint management, also known as active network management, can be deployed and the market-based constraint management to find the least cost solution for network constraint. And finally, uh, planning with the air integration. Next, please. Planning with the air is a key feature in DERMS, especially for Africa, as it will improve and accelerate customer interconnection process, enabling management of tremendously high connection requests and account for dynamic network chances. For example, a customer can simply apply for a new connection, then an automatic feasibility analysis will be run to check the request against the network constraint and finally the estimated cost and confirmation will be provided to the customer to check if he will be able to integrate uh, the network next please another feature of derms is the dynamic dr operating envelope it takes in consideration the variable thermal and voltage limits of the grid with the static limits the physical static limits in order to provide the operating limits and this will help to maintain the grid reliability and power quality alongside with the increasing the hosting capacity of our grid it will enable drr wholesale market participation with a better operation coordination between the regional transmission organization and the independent system operators. And finally, it will allow customer with the broadest level to access to the network. Next, please. So the last uh, enabler of smart grid are the microgrids. Next, please. Microgrids can be considered as the simplest and the realistic way of deploying smart grid and have a full access to energy. A microgrid is a group of interconnected loads and distributed energy resources with clean defined electrical boundaries that act as a single controllable entity with respect to the grid. Microgrid can connect and disconnect from the grid and this will enable to operate in both grid connected or islanded mode. Microgrids will help to optimize the energy cost by having a full control on the production, consumption, and the energy storage. Also, microgrids are uh, sustainable as the local energy in microgrids will be green coming from solar and wind energies. And finally, the ensure reliability of the grid throughout its ab ab ability to island itself from main grid and be self-sufficient in the case of blackouts. Please, next. And uh, hereafter, uh, some cases of smart grid deployment. For example, PICO, a US electric and natural gas utility delivering power to more than 1.6 million customer in southeastern Pennsylvania, they deploy a project combining ecostructure derms from Schneider Electric with the microgrid controller. The microgrid con contains a variety of uh, DAR like gas generator, batteries, solar and wind turbines. The bidirectional communication between the derms and the microgrid allow the calculation of active and reactive energy set points at the point of camel coupling with the customer, which provide them with the stability and reliability of their network. Next, please. 
Another case is from Enel, the largest power company in Italy. Enel needed an advanced solution that could help them minimize power energy losses and to manage distribution network effectively. They deployed EcoStructure ADMS uh, from Schneider Electric and the result were 144 gigawatt hour saving of energy per year and they have a significant cost saving throughout optimization of existing network resources, uh, resources and uh, operation. To this, I conclude my presentation and I hope to see more kind of this application in Africa. And thank you all. Thank you very much, Mohamed. Very interesting, and it's the hope the, of, for the future of Africa. We really hope that soon we will have really a lot of these uh, best, best practice, best cases that we uh, had the chance to see in uh, your presentation during today. Now we are, uh, thank you very much, Mohamed. We are uh, coming to an end. I would like to give the floor to our Secretary General, Mr. Roberto Bigotti, for his uh, final speech. Roberto, please. Can you hear me, uh, Carlo? Yes. yes. Thank you so much for this um, webinar. I think it was a very useful webinar. I believe more and more than I see the uh, how professional and how impressive the presentation are that Carlo, at the end of the five webinar, we should make a collection uh, of the best uh, uh, presentation, part of them to make a kind of, of a virtual booklet uh, by which we can um, collect the main um, uh, experience and the suggestion of the our member so that we can prepare a kind of booklet uh, for shaping uh, the future of the digitalization uh, effort uh, throughout the uh, foundation. And certainly, as I said before, when we will resume our advanced training course, uh, uh, one day, a full day, will be dedicated to this topic, uh, uh, Carlo, and we will use uh, cherry picking from uh, what we have heard there. So thank you again for this. I would like to conclude this webinar just uh, uh, reminding you the appointment I sent to Fabio uh, uh, the last slide that uh, possibly can be shown, which tells about the uh, coming uh, uh, event on uh, um, on the 15th of July. Uh, I hope that Fabio got my email and can show uh, the slide. Uh, basically, we have uh, the rationale why we launch uh, uh, Grids for Africa which is a, a comprehensive cluster of activities, uh, which as we know from what we heard now, uh, dear colleagues, uh, it's a prerequisite also to make digitalization uh, a winning choice. So in, thank you so much, Flavio. You see the first slide, you see the concept note, uh, why we want to launch uh, this um, uh, Grid for Africa initiative. We will have a, a first meeting on, on July 15, why in September, which will be more the rationale why we have, uh, we'll see in a moment, uh, the, 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 the agenda. And then uh, in September, we will send you, we invite you to a new event called, uh, you see in the, la in the next, the last chapter here, involvement of, no, go back, uh, Fabio, Susan. Fabio, just go, just go back. Okay. Involvement of a private sector in grid development in Africa, which I think is the key uh, item we want to show as a first activity. So the, the Grid for Africa launch, as it says here, will be July 15. Next slide now. Yes, only one next one. And you see here the draft agenda. It will be opened by our chairman, Bernabe, Red for Africa president. Then we have uh, invited the Vera Song uh, of UNECA, uh, the DG Energy Director General, the IEA, Mr. Camiseca for Gene, Matteo Codazzi from Chasey, Caspar Erzberg of Schneider Electric, Professor Ariaga from MIT and Comillas, and Daniel Shaw, African Bank. Finally, Lord Branchard from EDF. So see, this is a very impressive meeting. Uh, we invite all of you to join because we'll open the new, you see also up on the right, uh, the new logo, which will be the secondary logo, Rest for Africa Foundation on the left. On the right, you see a Grid for Africa logo. And uh, since then, we will announce the program. 
after the summer, we will do this. Um, we already have the draft, the first presentation of uh, how to involve private sector to deploy at scale infrastructure in Greece in Africa. So if you want to be invited, uh, you can ask, of course, uh, Carlo or Asia or the people um, who are here to be, uh, because it's our webinar, we can invite as many of you you want to come. But if you see the name, it's absolutely a top event, which makes uh, sense for you to listen because it's a complimentary day. So with this uh, final invitation, I thank you very much for your attention. Again, congratulations for the quality and the, the professional approach you gave. Our member are very proud. But again, I think we should collect the best, uh, some uh, la creme de la creme, as we say in French, in Italian. What is best to make a little booklet with all the uh, finding to guide us uh, in the in the next steps. So thank you so much, Carlo. Thank you, Asia. Thank you, Fabio. I think we have uh, again uh, closed uh, the fourth webinar on uh, uh, digitalization, which I know it's a cross-cutting issue throughout the foundation, but certainly we'll find an echo in the future advanced training course in the future let's say outreach program and particularly following the grid for africa there so if we, there's nothing else uh, it's almost one o'clock i thank you so much and uh, i invite you to stay in tune with us by the way in a week time we will launch a new website restforafrica.org which i think will be i think you should like it it's more stylish and more informative and uh, you'll see Ok, arrivederci a tutti quanti, bye bye, see you soon after summer.